Good afternoon, everyone. I am Zach Nowak, a junior from Brockport, New York, studying international relations and Japanese language. And I would like to welcome you to the January series 2019. We would also like to give a special welcome today to the guests at four of our 52 remote webcast sites. Brand new site, South Bend, Indiana, Linden, Washington, Hastings, Michigan, and Wittensville, Massachusetts. And now, if you'll please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity you've given us today to attend this lecture. Prepare our hearts to receive, our, our ears to listen, and our minds to understand and discern the message you've given to your servant, Arthur. Thank you for him and the work he has done as a man after your own heart, and inspire us through his message to see one another as your beloved sons and daughters, and to be kingdom extenders in this country, proponents of your unconditional love. Amen. And now, Michael Watson, professor of political science, will introduce our guest. Good afternoon and welcome to the second day of the January series at Calvin College. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today. Arthur Brooks is a New York Times columnist, a New York Times best-selling author, a co-author with the Dalai Lama, a professional musician who spent many years playing in Europe, an academic with a PhD in public policy, professor for a number of years at Georgia State and Syracuse University, and starting this summer, he will join the Kennedy School at Harvard University, where he will serve as a professor of public leadership and as a senior fellow at Harvard Business School. He hails from one of the most progressive regions in the country, Seattle, Washington. Given this resume, Seattle, academic, New York Times, Harvard, Massachusetts, it may surprise you to learn that for roughly the last 10 years, he has served as the president of the American Enterprise Institute perhaps the leading conservative think tank in the country, overseeing a remarkable period of growth for AEI. In a political and cultural season marked by polarization, frustration, and anger, as you are about to see, Dr. Brooks models a different approach to political engagement, an approach characterized by evidence and data and strong convictions, but more than open to conversation. With a conservative voice, that is not just speaking to or for conservatives, and an emphasis on compassion for Americans of all stripes and conditions, an emphasis not tacked on to conservative principles, but because of conservative principles. After his address, Dr. Brooks will be avail available to greet you in the West Lobby here in the Covenant Fine Arts Center, where several of his books will be available. Calvin College is grateful to Barnes and Thornburg LLP and also the Paul Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics for underwriting today's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Arthur Brooks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. What an honor it is for me to be with you here today. What a delight to be back at Calvin College. I haven't spoken here uh, for some years. I was on the January series, I think, eight years ago. This was under construction, or it was under rehabilitation, and I spoke in the chapel. Um, this particular auditorium, strangely, is not foreign to me, um, nor is Calvin College, nor Grand Rapids, Michigan. On the contrary, uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, my father came up with the crazy idea. He was a professor at Seattle Pacific University, obviously in Seattle, and he came up with the crazy idea of trading jobs and lives with a professor someplace else. And we went to Grand Rapids, Michigan to spend one year. I spent my sophomore year in high school at Grand Rapids Christian High School, of all things. And my father was a professor in the math department here for that one year. I came to a concert, or a series of concerts, in 1979 in this very auditorium. How delightful it is to be back with you, and what wonderful memories I have of this place, and ongoing experiences I have with Grand Rapids as well. I have a wonderful set of friendships, uh, deep collaboration uh, with Dick and Betsy DeVos, who both of whom have been on the board of AEI, with Doug and Maria DeVos, who've been supporters of AEI. By the way, Doug DeVos was my classmate at Grand Rapids Christian in 1979. I'm practically from here. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Um, I'm delighted to be part of this series at this particular juncture in American history because it's just so hard in Washington, D.C., where I live, so you don't have to. <laughs> Basically, it's a tricky time because there's so much bitterness and there's so much hatred. Now, I run a think tank that's been around for 80 years, president of the American Enterprise Institute, and I want to give you a, a little bit of a clue into what think tanks do. We're often called universities without students. We do research and we solve big public policy problems and work with politicians, but here's really what public policy think tanks are all about. We try to solve the problems that don't appear to have solutions. How? Not by thinking harder in conventional ways, but by thinking in new ways, to think differently about old problems. That's the trick behind the work that we do. Now, that shouldn't sound very revolutionary. Most of you know that when you have a big problem in your life, by thinking harder in the old way, you're not going to solve it. You need an epiphany appropriate coming up on the 7th of January. You need a breakthrough, a new way of thinking. That's my stock and trade as president of AEI. All of you have experienced this, whether in your work or in your study or even in your personal life. I have them all the time. Um, I was reminded of an, ex an, an example of this um, in my family life. My wife, Esther, and I, we've been married for 27 years. We have three kids. Uh, some of them are still, te two of them are still teenagers. Uh, pray for us. And um, we had an experience uh, some years ago when our middle son, who's now a wheat farmer in Idaho, was still in high school. And we were having a, an enormously challenging parent-teacher conference. It was going poorly. And it was a grades issue. It was bright kid, really I mean terrific, not living up to his, the standards that he should be academically. And there was kind of warning flares going up. And it was really, and it was an old problem. It was a thing that had come back. And some of you who are parents, you know how this feels. Those of you who are students, you probably did this to your parents, go apologize. <clears throat> So my son, you know, was, he was having trouble with his grades, and they were giving us a lot of warnings, and it was really stressful, and it was an old problem. We didn't know how to solve it. And we got in the car, and we were on the way home after this parent-teacher conference, and my wife, who's an optimist, she's from Barcelona, and, uh, and she, it's kind of, we're, kind of, we're not talking, we're thinking about it, and finally my wife breaks the silence, and she says, I think we need to think about this old problem in a new way. And I said... I'm all ears, sweetheart, because I don't know what to do. She said, at least we know he's not cheating. <coughs> <laughs> See, that's new thinking. And in that spirit, I want to take up the biggest problem that I think that we have in policy and politics in America today. What's that? That's the way we treat each other as Americans. Okay, now, some of you are on the political right, and some of you are on the political left, and some of you are in the political center or nowhere at all. But I bet not one of you likes it. Not one of you likes how the political discourse is working. We are racked with disdain and even political hatred today. You know, when the, the policy debates, or the, 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 the campaign debates were going on in the run-up to the 2016 election, and and Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were debating each other, and, 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 and all of America was watching. I remember saying to my daughter, my 15-year-old daughter, now, honey, remember, this is, not a, this is not follow our values as a family, the way that these people are talking to each other. Amazing. These are candidates for president of the United States, and I'm warning my daughter not to behave that way. That's hugely problematic. And it's endemic, and it's a... It's, it, it, it's a problem that's going all across the political spectrum today, and it's getting worse. And I want to find a solution that I can share with you, and I want to set us all to work in solving it, but I need a new way of understanding the problem. That's my subject today. Okay, now, when you talk about politics, frequently people will say that it's too angry. People are too angry with each other. Too much anger in American politics. And there is plenty of anger in American politics today. But that's actually not the problem. I'm a social scientist. I'm a, I do work in behavior, and I have my whole career. And I can assure you that when you have a problem of relationships, anger is never the big problem. Anger and divorce 
are not correlated. It's surprising to a lot of people. It's reassuring to me because I'm married to a Spaniard. <laughs> We've had 10,000 arguments and no hint of separation or divorce. Anger says, in a relationship, especially a relationship based on love, anger says, I care what you think and I want to make things better. The problem in American politics today isn't anger. The problem is much worse. It's what psychologists call contempt. Contempt is, according to the great 19th century uh, philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, contempt is the conviction of the utter worthlessness of another person. Anger is hot, contempt is cold. Anger says, I care. Contempt says, you're beneath caring about. That's, my friends, that's how we talk to each other in American politics today. And that's a big problem. Let me tell you how big a problem it actually is by taking you on a little tour of, in the world of marital reconciliation and divorce. Because I just used that example a minute ago, right? There's a psychologist, he teaches at the University of Washington in Seattle, um, who's a friend of mine, he's been on my, my podcast show and somebody who's actually featured in a new book that I have coming out in March. His name is Professor John Gottman. Gottman runs the Gottman Marriage Laboratory with his wife, Julie. He has literally brought thousands of couples back together that were on their way to the divorce court. He is my hero. Because anybody who keeps families together, anybody who keeps couples together, anybody who rejuvenates love is an American hero. Families are the basis of success in any culture across all of history, and you know it and I know it. Anybody who can keep a family together is doing good. And that's what John Gottman does. Now, he's an expert in diagnosing problems in marriages. You know, he has this actually very interesting kind of party trick that he can do. He'll counsel, he'll, he'll interview a couple for an hour. And at the end of an hour, asking just a series of questions, these are couples that are quarreling, he can tell with 97% accuracy if that couple will be divorced within three years. What's he looking for? You want to know. If those of you who are married, you want to know. So you cannot do this, expressing contempt. It doesn't matter if they're angry with each other. No problem. Go to it. Contempt, bad. Contempt means divorce. Now, how does he know if they're expressing contempt with for each other? Sarcasm, derisive jokes, and most importantly, eye rolling. Eye rolling is the ultimate physical sign of contempt. Those of you who've had teenage kids have seen lots of eye rolling. That's sort of different. That's part of being a teenager. But when somebody who's your spouse or your coworker, your fellow citizen, somebody who owes you respect, rolls their eyes, it's almost like a physical attack. You never quite forget it when somebody treats you with contempt. And that's what we're doing to each other in American society today. Somebody says something you disagree with politically, oh, it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard ad hominem arguments about, I know what you're really all about. Let me tell you why you think that. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. That's how politicians talk to each other. That's how the media trains us to act toward each other on both the right and the left. That is the level of discourse on many of our elite college campuses. Dismiss as worthless your political foe. Pure contempt leads to divorce. And that's where we are. That's the reason we can't get along. You know, when you're treated with contempt, you're going to have an enemy. You'll never quite forget it. So the real question is, how do we take on contempt? Because contempt is the foe. If you want things to be better, look, I know you've got political opinions, and so do I, and you want your political side to prevail. I got it. That's part of the competition of ideas. But if you really believe that we, as a democracy, we, can't, we cannot sustain our nation until we get past this contempt problem, we have to find a solution that all of us can participate in starting today. Okay, that, my, my friends, I believe, is our challenge. Now, what's the conventional solution? Remember, I run a think tank, so I have to figure out what the conventional solution is and then reject it and move on to something bigger and better. So, what's the conventional solution to a country that's being racked with contempt? Here's the conventional solution. We need more civility. We need more tolerance. That's wrong. Why? Because those are garbage standards. If I tell you, 
You know, my wife Esther and I, we're civil to each other. You'd say, oh man, you guys need some counseling. If I told you, you know, AEI, the place where I'm president, it's, a, it's an okay place. I think my employees tolerate me. I'd say, whoa, you got some problems on your hands. Civility and tolerance are not a high enough standard for a great nation. What do we need? We need love. That's what we need. That's what we deserve. That's what we are called to, is loving our neighbor. Maybe even, if you believe St. Matthew in the fifth chapter, 44th verse of his gospel, maybe we need to love our enemies. If that's the standard to which you're called and to which I'm called, we need a better solution than civility and tolerance. St. Matthew didn't say, be civil to your enemy. Tolerate your enemy. Love your enemies. Hmm. So how do we do it? How do we do something like this? I'm in the hunt now, and about two years ago, I started thinking about this. I said, how do we love our enemies? How do we live up to the standard of love that's the only thing that can obliterate contempt? And, and, and I was looking for the big epiphany, because this is always the research project, is finding the big breakthrough. And, and, and I started, actually, I think I found the beginnings of it at a, a rally that I was speaking at in New Hampshire. Now, for a living, I get to talk to people about ideas. It's an incredible privilege. I love it. I love my job. I hope that's obvious. <laughs> I do 175 speeches a year as president of AEI. And I, I speak to all different sorts of audiences. I speak on really left-wing college campuses and on centrist business groups, and I speak to activist conservative organizations, and <laughs> it's an incredible, incredible opportunity to share ideas. And I was in the latter category. It was a conservative activist group in New Hampshire where I was speaking to about six or 700 activists, but really sort of very conservative, so three-cornered hats and the whole, the whole nine yards. <laughs> and... Uh, I was the only non-political candidate on the docket. Everybody, literally everybody else was running for president. It's before the presidential election and before the, before the primaries even started. You know, and they're one after the other. I mean, they were getting out there and basically throwing raw stakes into the audience. Just firing them up. You know, everything you think is right and the other side is stupid. That kind of stuff. And I, I came a little early and I had my, one of my sons with me. And I was talking to him backstage. We were listening to this thing. And, and I said, what do we, what should I do here today? And he said, well, I don't know, Dad. Maybe you can make them better. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes, right? <laughs> so I thought to myself, what could I do to make this situation better? I'm not going to go out there and tell them they're wrong. And for the most part, look, I'm, I'm politically pretty conservative. I'm, for the most part, I think they're right. What I don't like is the hate. So what can I do to make it better? And I, and I put together a little phrase that I was going to throw out, and I got it up in the middle of my speech, and I was talking about foreign policy and economic policy and all the stuff that I do, but in the middle, I stopped because I was ready, and I said, now, look, we're talking about conservative policies that I believe in and that you believe in, but I want you to remember something. I want you to remember the Americans who are not here who don't agree with us. Progressives. And I want you to remember that they're not stupid and they're not evil. They're just Americans who disagree with us. Now, I knew it wasn't going to be an applause line. <laughs> but what I wasn't waiting for was what happened next. This lady, nice lady, I'm sure, puts up her hand and she says, I think they're stupid and evil. <laughs> huh. Now, she didn't mean it to repudiate me and I wasn't offended. It was a joke and people laughed, kind of. But you know what I thought about at that moment? I thought about Seattle. Why? Because as you heard a minute ago, it's my hometown. You know, my dad was a college professor and my mom was an artist in Seattle. What do you think their politics were? <laughs> I'm the black sheep. I'm the odd one, right? And let me tell you something. When that lady said that, I, I know she, didn't, she meant it in jest. She didn't mean it to be mean. She was talking about my family, and I took it personally. <laughs> I can tell you, there are a lot of things, but they're not stupid, and they're not evil. They're my family. And here's the epiphany. You got strong views, and so do I. 
When was the last time you heard something about your family stated by somebody on your side that you don't even know? Quick quiz. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you love somebody with whom you disagree politically? 100%. (laughs) Close enough. I'm rounding it off to 100%. And that's really, really good news. I'm really happy to hear that. Okay, when is the last time that some guy on TV on your side effectively said that your sister-in-law is stupid and evil? Did you take it personally? When is the last time at a party somebody who uh, agrees with you went out and kind of insulted your mom? Did you say something? My dad used to say when I was a kid that the mark of moral courage is standing up to the people who agree with you on behalf of people who disagree with you. See, it's really easy to stand up to people who disagree with you. They're wrong, right? It's really hard to stand up to people who agree with you. And yet, that's the only place where you're going to get traction. You have no credibility standing up to people on the other side. You have tons of credibility to the one who stands up to your own side. This is the epiphany. That's what we need to do. This has to be a systematic program of standing up to our own side, no matter what our side is, on behalf of the other side. Not agreeing with the other side, but standing up for the other side. And in so doing, we will be agents of unity, of harmony, of solidarity, and of brotherhood. How? See, that's hard, isn't it? How do we do it? How do we remember it? How do we make ourselves agents of that kind of change? So that's the next question that I had in my research agenda, is how we do that. Now, the first way to answer that is to remember, or to think, or to reason, why we display so much contempt in our politics today. You know, I've done it. I confess to you. I've rolled my eyes. I've laughed derisively. I've dismissed people. I go on TV a lot. I'm sure I've done it for national audiences. Why? It's not because I'm being a bad person. It's not that my heart is dark and filled with hate. It's because I have a bad habit. It's just a habit of communication. We see it over and over and over again, and, and, and we participate in the combat by returning contempt in kind, and it becomes an ingrained habit. The problem is it's an incredibly deleterious habit for the health of our nation, for the future of our democracy, for the strength of our polity, and for the quality of our hearts. That's why it's a problem. We have to break a bad habit. Now, there's a lot of new neurological research about habit formation, and there are all kinds of habits, everything from, from you know, the way that you behave to the things that you consume. And what they all have in common, what all habits, good and bad, have in common, is that they bypass their actions that bypass past the medial prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain right behind your forehead that governs all of your conscious actions. Habits don't pass that part of your brain. They're not conscious actions. They involve a part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens. That's a deep, deep part of your brain that was evolved a th- a more than a million years ago, before the medial prefrontal cortex was even a thing. Why? Because it was important to have habits that would bypass consciousness, that you could do things automatically that, that, were, that were important, that were good, that would keep you alive. The problem is they now reinforce bad habits. So what do you need to do to break a bad habit? The answer is you need to reprogram your nucleus accumbens, not by simply not doing something bad, but by substituting another behavior for it. You feel a stimulus, you have a behavior, you have an urge, you recognize it and do something else in its place, and usually within three weeks you can reprogram your nucleus accumbens. New habit, new behavior, new life. That's the best neurological research on habits. Okay, so what's my habit? Talking contemptuously to other people. I need to break that habit. By the way, all of you have broken habits in that way. I used to be a professional French horn player. The worst habit I had was the same habit that almost all musicians have or did in the day, which is I smoked. And I was embarrassed about it, and it was stupid, and it made my mother sad, and it was expensive. So I decided to quit smoking, but I had to do something else in its place. So I started drinking. (laughs) No. (laughs) The bottom line is if you've got a bad habit in your communications, when you feel the urge to do something, you need to do something else in its place. 
What? What should you do when you're treated with contempt? What should you do when you feel contempt? You feel an eye roll coming on. What do you do? You know, I was... Uh, I've done a lot of work, as you heard. I've, I've, I'm a co-author with and, and collaborator for a long time with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It's a very unusual partnership. A guy who runs a, thing, a conservative think tank in Washington, D.C., and the, the head of the Tibetan Buddhist people, and literally the most respected religious figure in the world, who lives in the, the Himalayan foothills in Dharamsala, India. I've been working with him for a long time, and it's a beautiful friendship that I value very highly, and he's a wise man. And about the time that I was going through this research, I was thinking, how do I break this habit? How do I advise people to break this habit? I was talking to him because we were filming, we're making a documentary film called The Pursuit, which is coming out, by the way, this spring. And, and, and between takes, I said, your holiness is the Buddhist monk, 80 years old. I said, your holiness, what should I do when I feel contempt for another person? And he said, practice warm-heartedness. And I thought to myself, you got anything else? Because, <clears throat> you know, that just sounds sort of weak, right? Practice warm-heartedness. But then I gave it a little bit of thought. It turns out it's not weak at all, is it? When somebody treats you with contempt and you feel contempt, the hardest thing to do is to answer with kindness and love. The hardest thing to do. And, and by the way, here's how the Dalai Lama practices that himself. For those of you who don't know, the leader of the Tibetan Buddhist people has been in this role since he was a teenager. He was exiled by the communist Chinese when he was a teenager and forced into exile with a small band of poor, impoverished, pacifistic Tibetans never to return to their homeland. Why? Because naked, aggressive communist force was trying to make the Tibetan Buddhists disappear from the public stage forever. They rolled over the Tibetans. He went into exile, and what did he do? He became the most respected religious figure in the world over the next six decades, keeping the cause of Tibet and freedom and religious freedom alive. He's a hero. You know who he is, most of you do. Why? Because he was aggressive? Because he was contemptuous? Because he wrote nasty op-eds and went on CNN? No because he practiced warm-heartedness. He told me that he starts every morning praying for the communist Chinese leaders. Not that they'll give him back his homeland, but that they'll live good and happy and fulfilling lives. That's tough. See, contempt is for weak people, reactive people. Warm-heartedness is for strong people who are in control. Now, here's my question. How do I do that? How do I remember that? How do I react in the right way? And he gave me a valuable piece of advice that I want to pass on to you. If you're with me, if the big epiphany is that we have to fix contempt and the way to do that is in our own personal interactions and the personal interaction is to answer contempt with warm-heartedness, now you have to ask yourself, how do I do that next time? He said, it's simple. Remember a time when you accidentally did that. Think about it, meditate on it, and recall the sensation every time you're into in, in another interaction like that. It's a standard psychological technique, as a matter of fact. And so I went back to my little room in Dharamsala. We were making this movie, I had this little room where I stay, and I meditated on it a little bit, I prayed about it, and I remembered a time when I did that, when I was treated with contempt, and I answered with warm-heartedness by accident. And I want to share it with you not because I want you to use my story, because I want you to think of yours. <clears throat> the year was 2006. I was a professor at Syracuse University. And I was really happy because being a professor is the best job literally in the world. And you know, I was beavering away in relative professorial obscurity. I was writing my academic journal articles, and I was teaching my graduate students, and I was writing books that nobody ever read. <clears throat> And, which was great in its way. You know, you always kind of dream about having an audience, but, my, but, but frankly, my books were very boring and very technical, and why would you read them? Okay, so in 2006, I was doing a work, I mean, my main area of research was the economics of charitable giving. And I wrote a book that year, and I published, um, on, on the difference between different groups of people. I wanted to know who thinks they give a lot to charity and who actually gives a lot to charity. 
And I broke down that difference with respect to religion and with respect to economic class and with respect to political party, right? And that turned out to be kind of controversial. But, but more than anything else, the President of the United States says something about it. And I went on TV, and pretty soon my book was selling hundreds of copies a day. And my life changed overnight. This happens to academics sometimes. It catches us by surprise. Suddenly you go from nowheresville in the public consciousness to being on TV every day. It, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do TV. <laughs> but here's the weirdest part. When my book started selling a lot of copies, and I was in the public eye because of these ideas, I started to get email and letters from total strangers. This had never happened to me before. I was unprepared for it. Every day, dozens of emails from people. Because when you have a book that a lot of people are reading, they feel like they know you after they read your book. And when they feel like they know you, they want to reach out to you. If they like you, they want to tell you about their grandma. <laughs> if they don't like the book, they want to tell you why you're not a good human being. And I was getting both of a lot. It was very disorienting. Okay, so about two weeks after the book comes out, I'm getting a lot of email. And it's a Wednesday or Thursday afternoon, and I'm in my office just working. And, and an email pops up, and I look at the email, and it's from a guy in Texas. Dear Professor Brooks, you are a fraud. This is an unpromising way to start email, I'll tell you. <laughs> but I keep reading. And the first thing that I notice is that this email is like 5,000 words long. It's going to take me 20 minutes to read this email. But I'm a good sport. I want to know what people have to say. So he's, I, I'm reading this email, and, and I realize as I'm reading through the email, which is blistering. I mean, it's very insulting that this guy has read every word in my book, and he's repudiating and refuting every point in totally insulting terms, like, you know, the, the, the columns in table 3.1 are reversed, you moron, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reading through this, point after point after point. And you know the thought that was going through my head? He read my book. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually filled with gratitude. Why? Because I'm an academic. Nobody's ever read my stuff before. And this guy, so I thought, you know, I got nothing to lose. I'm just going to tell this guy what's written on my heart. So I write back, you're so-and-so. I know you hated my book and think I'm a stooge. I got it. But it took me two years to write that book. I put my whole heart and soul into it. And you read every word. I'm so grateful to you for that. Thank you. Send. <laughs> All right. That means nothing's going to happen. He's not going to answer me. I know. I'm going to go back to work. 15 minutes later, ding. His response pops back up. I'm like, oh, boy. What's he going to be mad? What's he going to be, right? It's like another salvo coming. I open it up. Here's what it says. Dear Professor Brooks, next time you're in Dallas, if you want to get some dinner, give me a call. <laughs> huh. <laughs> what happened? power. <laughs> Just with a few words, I turned an enemy into a friend. Did he suddenly agree with my book? No. He still thought it was terrible, I'm sure. He just realized that he didn't hate me because of the way I treated him. With just a few words and a few keystrokes, I changed two hearts, mine and his. That's, my friends, the power of treating contempt with warm-heartedness, even if it's a mistake, even if it was by accident, even if it was inadvertent. And I learned something that day, and the Dalai Lama called me to remember that, and I did, and it's changed my life. Because what it tells me is that I can do that again and again and again, and so can you. So think of your example and remember how it set your heart on fire. That is the solution your solution, my solution, each one of us, how we can start to be the beginning of the solution to America's biggest problem. Each one of us needs to be an agent answering contempt with warm-heartedness. Okay. Each one of us can be an agent in answering contempt with warm-heartedness. Because you're going to be treated with contempt. If you're on social media within the next hour, if you're talking about politics within the next 24, you're going to have an opportunity. Now, my last few minutes, I need to be a little bit more specific. 
Because what I want to do is I want to give you a, a handbook on how to do it. I told you I have a book coming out on March 12th called Love Your Enemies. And this is a handbook that tells you how you can do exactly what I'm talking about. It gives you a step-by-step approach. And I want to give you three examples that are actually from this book, things that you can do, that you can put into action starting today. What can you do to answer contempt with warm-heartedness? What can you do to be part of the solution to the problem? Now, answer number, I was going to say number one, I'm going to call this answer number zero, because here's not the solution. Agree more. It's not the solution. America doesn't need more agreement. Like, oh, let's all get along. Let's have a third way. Let's all just compromise and, and, and shove to the sides the things that we disagree on. That's wrong. That's mediocre. That's not the American way. The American way is the competition of ideas. The single biggest philosophical advance of American society that's truly changed the world and made a world that was almost completely poor into one that's mostly not. You know what it is? It's the idea that competition is good. Now, that doesn't mean shutting down competition by trying to blow up your foe. It means cooperating and to see who can do something better. It's true in sports. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, you know, comp- competition in sports is the reason that you turn on football on s- Sundays. If it was one team, it wouldn't be interesting. It's the reason that we love it in politics. is because democracy is a good and beautiful thing. That's competition. It's free enterprise, which has made us the richest country in the history of the world, and one where, in general, we don't envy people who've done well. And we need it, again, in the competition of ideas. And the competition of ideas means disagreement. So agreement is not what I'm calling you to do. That is not one of the solutions. You need to disagree, not less, but better. So what are the solutions? Number one, number one. I'm going to call you to rebellion against the forces that are driving us apart. As they used to say in the 60s, stand up to the man. I have data that show that 93% of Americans hate the culture of contempt. 93% of Americans dislike the way that we treat each other and think it's pushing America into decline. And I agree with that, and I bet most or maybe all of you agree with that as well. Now, who are the 7% who disagree? They're the ones who are making a profit on it. They're the ones who are getting richer and more powerful and more famous by making us hate each other, right? Okay, so what I want you to do is get into your head somebody in that category who's pushing us to hate each other and making a profit off it, right? Somebody in media who's telling us to hate our enemies. Somebody in politics who's saying the other side is stupid and evil. Somebody in entertainment. Somebody on an elite college campus someplace, a professor who's saying that we have to hate people for whatever particular reason, okay? Get that picture in your mind of somebody. Think of a particular person, right? It's wrong. You got the wrong impression. Because you just thought of somebody who disagrees with you. You need to think of somebody who's agrees, who agrees with you, don't you? Now, what I want you to do over the next week is put together a list of people you agree with and who agree with you who are in the 7% driving America apart. Somebody who are in the business of making us hate each other. Make the list. Go slow. Be careful, make the list. Now, turn those people off. Stop listening to those people. And if they're around you in person, answer those people with love, but with determination. Say, stop insulting my sister-in-law. It's not right. Stand up to the man. That's your assignment number one. Assignment number two, go out looking for contempt. Embrace it. You know, it's funny, you know, when there's something that's really, really bad, usually I would tell you, run the other way. (laughs) Stay away from it, right? Run away from sin. I got it. But contempt is different, isn't it? Some of you have been involved in missionary activity in your lives. Congratulations. It's a good thing. Missionary activity is so critically important. But the problem with missionary activity is it's hard, isn't it? It's difficult because there's so much rejection, You know, when you're on somebody's porch, you know, looking out from behind the curtains going, I think it's missionaries, pretend we're not home. Missionary work is really, really tough because people who don't have that truth don't always want that truth. (laughs) Okay, so I have a a radical suggestion on how to to make missionary work easier. Only go to the houses where people already have the faith. Well, that's idiotic. 
because that's not the people who need the missionary work. The point of missionary work is actually the conflict, is the resistance. That's the point of missionary work in a nutshell. That's why it's hard, that's also why it's important. People who don't have the truth need the truth. You're the conduit of the truth. You gotta go where it's difficult. The same thing, my friends, is true in the case of contempt. You need to go where it is, why? Because you have the answer. Kindness, warm-heartedness, love, and respect. You've got that special neutralizing weapon against contempt, but you gotta go where it is, you gotta look for it. That's a hard thing to do. It can be an exhausting thing to do, but it's such a rewarding thing to do. How are you gonna do it? Two ideas, two ideas for you. Number one is you need more friends who disagree with you. America is incredibly good increasingly at avoiding communities that have disagreement with us. You can curate all of your ideas on social media with respect to people who already agree with you. You can go to college where people already agree with you. You can go to a job in a workplace where people already agree with you. You can move into a community where people already all agree with you, right? Don't do that. I mean, look, if you're already here, fine. But look for a way to meet people who disagree with you. And when you get there, engage people in polemical conversation, but do so with love and with respect and kindness, because you know what? They're probably never going to have met somebody like you. You are a representative. Remember, it's the funniest thing, you know, the, what, one of the things that they say in mission work, one of the piece, key pieces of, of advice that missionaries always get is remember, everything rides on how people see you as a person. If, you were a, if, if you're doing something sinful, if you're doing something negative, people are gonna attribute those characteristics to all the people with your faith. That's the key point of mission work, is being magnetic, is being winsome, is being attractive, is being above reproach. Same thing with you. Make new friends, and by force of your love, make your point of view attractive. Neutralize contempt that way. You need to go where you're not invited, make friends that are new, and say things that people don't expect. That's assignment number one of meeting contempt. Assignment number two is very practical. I, I introduced you to my friend John Gottman, the marriage counselor, earlier in this talk. And John Gottman has this uh, very interesting techniques when, he, when he's working with couples who are quarreling. One of the things that he's found is he has to give them very specific and tangible assignments. And here's the biggest problem. When you're new and in love, you can't think of anything to criticize about the other person. But when you're quarreling and maybe going to divorce court, you can't think of anything except criticisms of the other person. So here is his assignment. The, the, two, the members of the couple have to carry around notebooks and they can't criticize the other person until they've said five loving and affirming things. It's called the Gottman five to one rule. In other words, I wanna criticize my wife because she picked me up late, but I gotta say five loving and affirmative th affirming things first. And it's super hard for couples that are really quarreling. And by the way, even if you're not quarreling, do it. Do this, I recommend this highly, but here's my point. Do this in political life as well. If you are on social media, you need to send out five loving and affirming messages about people you disagree with before you can send out, you can forward one article that criticizes the other side. Imagine living the five to one rule. By the way, by the time you get through the five, you're gonna forget about the one. And everybody's gonna know you as that nice person. You're gonna get invited to fewer parties, probably but it's gonna be so good. Cause you didn't like those parties anyway. <laughs> find contempt. It is your objective to find it and meet it. Okay, last assignment. Practice gratitude. You know, when I, I told you that story about that book and the guy in Texas, the one thing I said to him was thank you. Right, my, my form of warm heartedness just cause it's so efficient. You can do that too, and it turns out that that is a, has a huge background in the social science literature. There's a book, uh, a wonderful book, it's, a, it's a self, the first big self-improvement book in the English language called How to Win Friends and Influence People. All of you who, like me, are over 40 have read it and forgotten it mostly. Anybody who's under 30 hasn't been encouraged to read it. Go read How to Win Friends and Influence People. It sounds like a guide on how to bend people to your will, it's not. It's a beautiful book about how to treat people with morality and to treat people with ethics. And one of the things that, that, that he, the guy who wrote it is Dale Carnegie. And what Dale Carnegie does is he, he travels around the United States, he finds the most successful people in every profession, he just interviews them about their secrets to success. 
And, and there's one point where he goes to a, a magician, the most famous magician of his age in the 1920s named Howard Thurston. And he goes to his act on Broadway. This guy's been doing the same tricks for 40 years, rabbits out of hats and, ha and, and card tricks. And he wants to know why this guy's so successful. So he's sitting in the audience watching, and he realizes that the secret to success is not the amazing tricks. It's the interaction, <coughs> it's the relationship between Howard Thurston and his audience. He's super into it. I mean, he's totally engaged. This is after eight shows a week for 40 years. And, you know, they laugh, and he laughs, and he's just, he's just involved. And so afterward, he goes back to Howard Thurston's dressing room and says, I see, I see the secret to your success. It's your involvement, your relationship with the audience. How do you do it after so many years? And Howard Thurston says, it's actually simple. Each night before I go out, I'm in my dressing room. I say this little meditation. I'm truly grateful for the people in this audience who make it possible for me to make my living doing something that's very agreeable. <laughs> and then, then the important part comes. Before he hits the, the footlights, he says under his breath, I love my audience. I love my audience. Huh. I, I remember reading that, and, and it affected me so much. It affected my career. What do you think I said before I came out on this stage? <laughs> and it's true. I didn't have to convince myself. I am so grateful to you. I love you. And <laughs> why? Because I'm making my living right now. It is the most beautiful thing I could possibly do to spread ideas of aspiration and affirmation and love because this is my life's calling and you're making this possible. Howard Thurston gave that advice to Dale Carnegie and it turns out he was just doing good social science. There's a wonderful study from 2003, University of California at Santa Barbara where these psychologists, they took these undergraduate kids and they had them make lists. <clears throat> so half the kids, it's like a drug treatment pro or drug program where they had treatment and control. So the treatment or the control group, they made lists of current events, top five things in the news. And the other half made lists of things that they were grateful for in their lives the top five things that they were grateful for. And then to look at their list for five minutes every day, and every Sunday they had to update their lists. <clears throat> at the end of 10 weeks, they measured their level of happiness. And the gratitude listers were 25% happier than the current events listers. My friends, that's free. You can do that. No, no, no. You should do that. I am doing that. And it's very important to my life. That gratitude reminds you of the natural warm-heartedness that you should be displaying. The gratitude that comes from living in a community that's affirming and a family that's loving and the greatest country in history. We get to be here. How could we not be grateful? And therefore, how could we not be warm-hearted? That's how gratitude works. Make your gratitude list. That's assignment number three. Now, here are my last words. I just referred to um, missionaries who have my unbounded respect and admiration because their work is so difficult, but on the other hand, it's so joyful. I'm calling you to be missionaries. I'm calling in, in, in this secular apostolate of answering contempt with warm heartedness and bringing America back together again. It's missionary work, isn't it? It's looking for a way to sneak in and change the way that people think and the way that people feel. And, and, and I'm reminded of this image, and this is the last image I wanna, I'm going to leave you with before we go to a little Q&A and before you go off and have lunch. Um, I, my wife, Esther, and I, we do marriage prep classes at a Catholic retreat center near our home. So we have 25 or 30 couples once a month that get together, and we talk to them about the secrets to a good and healthy marriage. And... It's wonderful, it's really fulfilling, it's fun. But there's at, this, at the chapel in this retreat center where we meet, there's a sign over the door. But it's not a sign over the door when you're coming in. It's a sign over the door as you're going out for the parishioners, for the congregants, for the members to, to read as they go out into the parking lot and leave after services. And here's what it says. You are now entering mission territory. So here's the last image I want to leave you with. I think I know the secret to the problem that we have in politics today. I think I know what to do. I think I know what I need to do and I what you need to do. But I want you to remember one thing. So as you leave this auditorium today, I want you to, to imagine a sign over the door. 
As you leave today, you and I, we're entering mission territory. God bless you and thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for that challenge. I appreciate it, and it's uh, I'm sure it's going to be very easy for us to do. So. Uh, if you have a question that's written out on a card, uh, feel free to hold that up, and we will collect that and bring it forward. Um, I'm Rick True. I'm the Director of Alumni and Community Relations here at Kelvin, and we'll take questions by Twitter and by email and by the cards um, in the audience. So um, I'm going to start with a question that came in from a student wondering, um, how do you go about setting up a personal mission statement and mission and vision statement um, to align with your values? Hmm. You know, this is one of the things that I recommend to everybody is that once a year, typically on your birthday, that you write your personal mission statement. And that's not the what of your life. I'm a dad, a grandfather, a brother, a friend. No, 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 that's a what statement, a why statement. What's the why of your life? And, and furthermore, you get 12 words. So, you know, don't go on and on. Don't be long-winded. Get it done. M remember it. And then share it at every possible opportunity without being heavy-handed. It's one thing I, I recommend to everybody because it's so morally inflecting and clarifying. So how do you set about doing that? You, you have to think about what is most important in your life, who you're trying to serve, and what do you stand for? is basically what it comes down to. You know, and, and people have done this all throughout history. I was talking to a, a, a fantastic group of students here at Calvin this morning, and they related the story of my favorite composer, Johann Sebastian Bach. And Bach was asked, I was a classical musician for 12 years, and Bach was my favorite composer. Near the end of his life, Bach was asked by a minor biographer whose name has been lost to history, why do you write music? This is asking him for his personal mission statement. Now, if you don't know anything about Bach, Three things stand out. Greatest composer in history, father of 20 kids, hmm? Christian. He wrote at the end of every single one of his manuscripts, to the glory of God. He said this, why do you write music? Here's his answer. The aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the refreshment of the soul. Can you say that about your life? <laughs> Can you say that about your work? Is your mission statement kind of like that? I refresh others' souls, and I glorify my Lord. How close can you get to something like that and mean it? I recommend that you think about that deeply. Make sure you believe it. Write it down. Review it every year and share it. If you do that, um, money-back guarantee, you're, you're going to like what, you, what happens. Not money-back guarantee, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've gotten several questions that um, have to deal with how do you deal with, um, how do you respond in love uh, to people who have views that you think are immoral or especially hateful? Yeah. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's one of the things I deal with in this new book. Um, how do you deal with people whose views you think are absolutely noxious? Well, to begin with, somebody's ideas are not the same as a person. You might feel that somebody's ideas are contemptible but no person deserves contempt. And that's a very important distinction to make because what we do is we, we treat people, people whose ideas we don't like as people who are beneath our respect, people who don't deserve any love or consideration at all. And that's a big moral error, especially for people who call themselves Christians. So to begin with, that's a distinction we have to make, the difference between ideas and people. Second, the worth thing worth pointing out is that when you treat somebody with contempt, no matter how much you hate their ideas, you foreclose the opportunity of making progress because you will make an enemy. Do you really ever want to make an enemy? I don't know about you, but I don't need more enemies. I need more friends. I need to take at least a shot at having more friends. And I have personally seen case after case where people met up who thought that each other's ideas were hateful and noxious and beneath contempt. And when for whatever reason they treated each other with a little bit of respect, they understood that they could have a conversation, that they could understand each other. Look, I have seen an interaction between a friend of mine who, his name is Hawk Newsom, who's the head of Black Lives Matter of Greater New York, on stage with a guy who runs Bikers for Trump. 
getting along. If they can do it, I don't care who you're talking about, you can do it too. <laughs> and that's the important thing to keep in mind. You are never, ever, ever called to contempt because all you'll ever do is make things worse and you have no p possibility of making things better. Um, you had mentioned um, some of the 7% being those who are making money, um, spreading contempt. And I'm wondering, you, you suggested shutting some of them out. And so people are wondering, do you have new sources that we could turn to that um, could help provide um, better balance? Yeah. Um, we, there are, <clears throat> one of the things that's really encouraging to me is that there are a lot of voices that don't get as much uh, airplay, airtime, as the really contemptuous voices and the polarizing uh, sort of demagoguery that we see on, on TV and, and in the newspaper and, and, and certainly online, but they're actually out there. And once you have your antennae up for people who don't display contempt, but rather answer contempt with warm heartedness, once you are on the prowl for that, you're gonna find it is the bottom line. So the first thing to do is to stand up to the voices, to start turning off the voices that are, are putting you in a dark place pushing you in the wrong direction, and you will suddenly start to see things that were in plain sight the entire time. The people that you want to be associated with, that's the best way to do it, but you have to turn down the volume. The screaming from the 7% is making it impossible for you to hear the best leadership in the 93%. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, this question is from a music major and a Seattle native and a Kelvin grad. Uh, wow. Yeah. It's like there's two of us. <laughs> I'm not a Kelvin grad, but close enough. Yeah. I'm curious if something specific prompted you to pursue public policy after your career in music, or if you've seen an overlap or influence between those two areas of your life. Yeah, um, thanks for that. I think that's my friend Josh, right? Um, he, because we were in, in, the, in the class earlier today, um, that's, that was a question that we got. And the answer is absolutely. Um, music is central to everything that I do. I mean, it's what I've done since I was, you know, when I was nine years old, I determined I wanted to be the greatest French horn player in the world. It's such a great country, isn't it, you know? And um, I didn't make it, you know, but I did make my, <laughs> I did make my living as a French horn player for 12 years, from when I was 19 until I was 31 years old. I didn't go to, I didn't finish college until I was 30. Um, so I have a very different kind of path. And most of my influences have been involved in art and music. And, and, and I, I just told you a minute ago about my idol, Johann Sebastian Bach. My, you know, my idol is a dad, my idol is a Christian. You know, some, not idol, it's a bad word. Anyway, the, um, they, they, you know, somebody that I really admire, certainly in, in art and music. And Bach, you know, when he said, you know, that quote that I gave you before, you know, the aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the refreshment of the soul. That cut, you know, I, said, I love that, but it cut me like a knife. Because like when I read that, I couldn't say that about my career as a musician. I was successful. I was playing in the Barcelona Symphony at the time. I was making a good living. I was playing music that I loved, but I couldn't say that. I couldn't say that I was, I was serving God and serving man because my heart wasn't in the right place. And I, I decided I was gonna find something that really fulfilled that mission, box mission, but for me, and it's the weirdest thing, you know, as I was looking around, I had this one salient fact stuck in my head that I had noticed in my study, in my early study of the economics business, that 80% of starvation level poverty had been eliminated since I was a kid. 80% of worldwide starvation level poverty had been eliminated. Most of you don't know that, but think about it. Two billion of my brothers and sisters have been pulled out of starvation level poverty, and the reason is globalization and free trade and property rights and the rule of law and the culture of American free enterprise spreading around the world. And I asked myself, what can I do to live Bach's mission in my life? And I became an economist. Cra Bach made me into an economist. Mm. It is the craziest thing ever. You can find your influences any place that you look for them as long as your heart is oriented toward the glory of God and the service of other people is the bottom line. And I can't, I gotta tell you, I am so much happier than I was when I was playing the French horn. Because I get it, mostly because like you all show up and listen to me now, they did, you wouldn't have if I was playing the French horn. <laughs> <laughs> But we can do these good things together, and, and I have, you know, I have Bach to thank. Dr. Brooks will be available in the lobby for signing uh, his books and for some questions. Let's thank him for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll go off.